All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa. I am a member of Socialist Action, and I want to invite you to a very special webinar that we have planned um, for you tonight. Um, tonight was the first in a series of presidential debates um, that are being held. And we have our very own special presidential candidate for Socialist Action, Jeff Mackler, with us tonight. Um, ready to give his analysis and thoughts on the debate. Um, if you're interested in our ideas um, after the webinar tonight, I would encourage everyone to check out our website, socialistaction.org. Um, we are going to be having um, ongoing coverage of the election on our website, and you can vote for Jeff for US president by writing in his name on the ballot when you mail it into the election office. So I would encourage everyone to give a socialist vote uh, for socialist action for something different than what we saw in the debate tonight. Um, so uh, yeah, the debate tonight was just kind of incredible. It was almost like a comical farce. <laughs> in my opinion, it was very difficult to hear the different candidates talk over each other. And sometimes their ideas didn't really seem too far apart. Um, Jeff, can you tell us what your overall take on the debate was tonight? Well, thanks, Lisa. Uh, glad to be with you here tonight. I must say that it was an embarrassing slugfest, so much so that uh, at certain times I thought that the moderator was going to cut it off and go home because uh, neither candidate, especially Trump, would allow uh, the other to answer any of the questions posed. But as you say, Lisa, on most of the questions, they were fake answers. Uh, they were answers designed to avoid their real positions, their public positions, on the record of their administrations. So, for example, <coughs> when Joe Biden tried to talk about a uh, uh, his support for Black Lives Matter. Um, President Trump answered correctly that under the Biden-Trump administration, the largest number and percentage of the American population is in jail, the majority Black, Latinx, and Native Americans. Obama's uh, and Clinton before it a program to end racism was to incarcerate the victims, giving the United States the highest number, as I said, and percentage of incarcerated people in the world. President Trump uh, mentioned that, but he wants to double down on the same thing. He blames the violence uh, and the crime on the victims, not on a system that denies people decent jobs, housing, and, uh, medical care, and all the other aspects of society that mitigate against people resorting to crime to solve individual problems. With regard to the recent events with Black Lives Matter, President Trump's solution is to send in the military to crush the Black Lives Matter movement on the grounds that they're the source of violence. Whereas the source of violence, the real source, the police, and the officers called in to use tear gas and poison gases and other materials to crush the right of people to peaceably assemble to protest is the real problem. Of course, neither of them mentioned the fact that among those centrally responsible for the violence, in addition to the institutions of the state, were government-funded provocateurs and right-wing neo-fascists that broke windows in order to place the blame for violence on the victims. That is the mass of people in the black community and oppressed communities that suffer daily from the racism inherent in the system. Both Biden and Trump sought to avoid that question. And while um, uh, Trump more openly and Biden more uh, subtly, but Biden was confronted with the problem of a record of his administration of mass incarcerations that far exceeded anything that even Trump has contemplated. 
The same thing with immigration rights, which neither discussed. President Obama deported 3 million people and subjected them to conditions of incarceration, separation from children that were unprecedented in the United States and worse than any president in history. So neither of us, neither of them mentioned that question. I'd be interested, Lisa, uh, from your point of view as a long-term immigration aspect, uh, uh, activist, what your take is on the immigration issue, three million people deported, and neither candidate mentioned anything about it. Yeah, you're right, Jeff. Um, immigration and what's happening with immigrants is one of the biggest stories and issues that's going on and affecting people in the US right now. You know, the US has been for, um, you know, since it was colonized and the native people here were murdered um, by Europeans, um, the US has been largely populated by immigrant populations. Um, immigrants often work in the lowest paid jobs. Um, they are more often essential workers and they're being greatly affected by the pandemic right now, especially undocumented immigrants. They don't have access to health healthcare. Um, they don't have access to job protections um, and they're in constant fear of deportation. And like you said, Obama was known as the deporter in chief among the immigrant community. Um, and Trump has continued that legacy. Um, he has continued to carry out uh, deportations and raids despite the pandemic that's going on. There have been huge concerns about COVID outbreaks within ICE detention centers. And most of those detention centers are actually run by for-profit companies that make billions of dollars off of housing immigrants in deplorable conditions. The US government could release those immigrants at any time, especially with the pandemic raging um, because they're being held on civil charges, not criminal charges, but they've refused to do that. However, um, the immigrant issue and everything that Trump has done is not going to be solved um, by electing a Democrat or another wing of the ruling party to the presidential, um, to be the president. This is an issue that's, um, it's part of the capitalist economy, which depends on immigrant workers to work for low wages in places like meatpacking plants. So this is a, a serious issue, but it's not going to be solved by electing Biden um, to the presidency. Um, and I, I would like to follow that up, Jeff, with another question for you that's related to um, this issue of police murders of black people. I live in Minneapolis. And so I was in the area that's uh, very close to where George Floyd was murdered earlier this year and we, where we saw massive protests, most of which were very peaceful, but have been very much represented in the media as riots um, led by dangerous people in the streets. Um, this is an issue that's been going on for decades. And this week we saw that the police that uh, murdered Breonna Taylor were let off the hook. They're not um, being charged with, with homicide. Um, and yet Biden says that he doesn't support defunding the police. He thinks that the police need more funding so they can um, get out in the streets and enforce law and order. Um, what does socialist actions take on this subject? That's a great question. Uh, I note that during the debate, um, President Trump criticized Biden for characterizing blacks as super predators and therefore justifying the laws that allowed for mass incarceration. Joe Biden didn't turn around and say, you characterize immigrants as rapists, as murderers. You wanna build a multi-billion dollar wall to keep them out. 
as opposed to understanding that the reason for immigration in the first place to the United States is because the policies of the United States government have effectively destroyed the economies of Mexico and Latin American countries where people are forced, if they have jobs at all, to work in the informal, settle, informal sector or for wages that are qualitatively less than the United States. But naturally, they seek to escape the poverty inflicted by the great imperial powers. So there's no difference between them. I noticed that Joe Biden had to say that his problem was with just a few, quote, bad apples. Our problem is with the state-sponsored police, the central repressive force to defend private property, the police who are called on to break up peaceful demonstrations, to arrest innocent predators, uh, uh, protesters in mass, who break strikes, who herd scabs through union picket lines, who enforce basically capitalist law. Breonna Taylor is just one example. The, we used to say that the Breonna Taylor attacks against unarmed innocent blacks took place on an average of one a day. Today, that figure is a thousand a year, almost triple that number. And the 99.9% .9 of these police attacks on unarmed, peaceful blacks go unpunished. The cops are set free. The cops are essentially the prime supporters of both Trump and Biden. And Biden doesn't want to lose their support. So he characterizes the problem with massive police brutality going back to the slavery times where the cops were basically those who were set out to organize the slave patrols to bring slaves back to the capitalist bosses. After slavery was formally ended, we had Jim Crow laws that were basically implemented to reintroduce slave conditions, to arrest uh, without cause, loitering was the cause, black people and send them back to the prisons and plantations of their former slave masters. You know, I'm an old guy, Lisa, but I'll tell you, I grew up in the civil rights movement where school desegregation was still legal in the United States, where every form of discrimination against Blacks was legalized. It took a massive social protest movement to challenge these reactionary laws, which were orchestrated and implemented by the Democratic Party. That party, the Democrats, were the party of the former slaveocracy. When I was a youngster, the Southern Democrats were all racist bigots and in alliance with the Northern liberals. So JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy ran for president as a Northern liberal with his uh, vice presidential candidate an open segregationist, Lyndon Johnson. When the Republicans took over the role of being the party of the former slaveocracy, the Democrats turned to the former racist pickets like Jimmy Carter, who grew up in a segregated church was elected to a school board on the grounds of being for busing. That is to bus white kids past black schools so they didn't have to attend desegregated schools. The same with Al Gore, whose father was an open racist bigot. And the same with um, Bill Clinton, who came from an openly racist state and was put forward in the presidency in order to assuage the concerns of Southerners that it was safe to vote for a Democrat. So racism is inherent in the system and both parties support it because it's profitable for capitalism. Why they say, uh, they can say to a white man, white boy, if you don't take a wage cut, we'll get a black person to take the job for less. And this differential between black and white wages, which is greater today than it has been in the modern era, is used to lower the general wage for all. If you can get a black man to work less because of racist reasons, you put a downward pressure on the conditions of all workers. As 
nothing in this racist system that benefits whites other than the hate generated by both parties against black people who they scapegoat, who they scapegoat like immigrants or even women. Women are going to take our jobs. Women are going to cause us to lower our wages because we have to raise theirs. So what we're dealing with is a racist warmongering system. You notice that Joe Biden criticized Trump for his uh, his uh, Russiagate policies, for his pro-Putin policies. We have the anomaly today where in order to scrounge up a couple of votes from the left, the president of the United States claims that we have to bring rein in the military industrial complex who profit by wars. The response of the Democrats is how dare you attack our military? They upped President Trump's proposed military budget $50 billion more. Both parties unanimously supported that budget, give or take a few votes. And then you have Joe Biden throwing in a cheap shot saying that President Trump paid virtually no taxes for the past 10 or 15 years and $750 when he came into office. What he neglected to say was the under the Democrats and now the tax bill supported virtually unanimously by the Democrats and Republicans, both parties gave and gifted the billionaires unprecedented amounts of money. They passed legislation, for example, uh, saying that Apple Computer, which had offshored $250 billion in profits, could repatriate the money provided there were no taxes on them. And corporations like Apple have doubled their value because of the various provisions of the tax codes. What neither of them say is that both parties are complicit in having their representatives write the tax codes that benefit in an unprecedented way the ruling rich. The United States has the largest discrepancy between rich and poor. In fact, one statistic that is shocking is that some dozen or less American billionaires earn more of the new value achieved by workers than 50% of the entire working class. Six or eight people earn more than half of the working class today. Neither of these parties, both the parties of capital, warmongering, racism, climate catastrophe, had anything to say. It was a fake, free-for-all, denunciatory debate where every major issue was covered up. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Biden even made um, a comment about how much wealth the billionaires uh, have gained during COVID-19 and because of COVID-19. <coughs> Um, while at the same time, we know that women and people of color and immigrants and minorities are suffering more than ever under the current pandemic. That's very hypocritical because, um, you know, these two <laughs> white men that are, you know, battling for the presidency and they're claiming to represent the American people, they come from that same ruling class. They don't really represent the interests of regular people who are working and trying to get by and struggling when people are being evicted from their homes and they don't have access to health care um, and they're dying in unprecedented numbers because of the pandemic that we're living through. So, um, I guess I wanted to kind of go back to a question um, that came up at the uh, beginning of the debate. Um, Obviously, uh, we had a big blow. Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, passed away, and now there's this big fight over who's going to fill her spot on the Supreme Court. Um, it was brought up that um, <coughs> any issues that affect women, um, such as Roe v. Wade, 
um, or access to health care, access to abortions, reproductive rights are under attack right now. Um, and the Supreme Court decisions could have bearings on that. Um, and it was also brought up that, um, you know, arguing over who's going to end Obamacare, about the access to private insurance for people. Um, you know, I, I'd like to know a little bit about your take on the whole in, uh, question around health insurance and access to health care. What does socialist action believe is a solution um, to this this huge crisis that we're facing? Well, in truth, the United States is perhaps the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have free health care for everyone. All the other countries weren't gifted it by the ruling class. Workers fought for it. They struck for it. They challenged the government's legitimacy for it. And in the post-World War II period, they won free health care. That's because most of the capitalist governments of Europe were either dominated by the fascists on one side or pro-fascist governments like the Italians and the French that collaborated with Hitler. And at the end of the war, angry workers who rejected these policies forced in massive mobilizations and strike waves, unprecedented then, to force the government to make concessions. In the United States, which emerged victorious in World War II, we had a temporary upsurge in worker militancy, but the domination of the United States that came out of the war allowed the ruling class to make some concessions. So today, we have no free health care. We have Obamacare that bases itself essentially on the profit making unprecedented highest profit rates in the country, medical, privately owned medical industry and its associated pharmaceutical corporations. The idea that the Obama administration would challenge the right of profit, would even accept a minimal reform like Bernie Sanders eliminating the insurance companies and paying directly which would have saved billions of dollars to cover health care. Even that reform is unacceptable, not only to Trump, but to the Democrats. So Obamacare is basically a Band-Aid coverage that allows profit gouging, privately owned insurance companies, medical organizations, pharmaceutical corporations to extract additional billions of dollars from working people when Healthcare should be a basic human right. To be free from racism should be a basic human right. For women to have equal jobs, as opposed to getting paid 73 cents for every dollar that men make, make should be a basic right. Even with regard to COVID, women are disproportionately affected. They have the majority of the jobs in the lowest paying industries. They are largely responsible in the absence of childcare provisions, free childcare for the maintenance of childcare and therefore can't return to work to start with because of these obligations. So in summary, we live in a racist, sexist, homophobic society, a bipartisan project that Democrats and Republicans are in business to maintain with Biden number one in the Democratic Party. Uh, he emerged from the primaries when he received the push over the hill, over the top from the billionaires who entered the race basically on his behalf. Let me say this on the Democrats. If I were to ask you, Lisa, how many billionaires are signed on for Biden, I bet you wouldn't have any idea in comparison to Trump. But the statistics that are out now say that Joe Biden only has 131 billionaires on his side, whereas Donald Trump has a pathetic 93 billionaires. I might say that I don't have any billionaires on my side. In fact, when I tried to get on the ballot in California, uh, a number of years ago, 
asking that I be listed as Jeff Mackler, Socialist Action, they said I couldn't list the name of my party. All the Democrats and Republicans could list their parties. So I went to court and a compliant Republican or Democratic judge fined me and a few others $240,000 in legal fees for asking for the right to be on the ballot with my party. Those kind of restrictive ballot laws are the norm in the United States. In truth, we have an election between multi-billionaires with each side bragging now, the Democrats bragging that they're raising more money than Trump. But let me turn to a critical question. I'd like to hear your commentary. The election is about 35 days away. And President Trump has announced that he is not going to commit in advance to a peaceful transition, should he lose. On the basis, he says, that mail-in ballots, which are between 40 and 60 million people, are illegitimate, are illegal, are fake, are contrived, even though he himself votes by, has voted by mail-in. Imagine a situation where on election day, the president of the United States says, I won because I'm not gonna count the mail ballots. And some two thirds, 78% of the Democrats vote by mail. So without counting those ballots, he's gonna declare himself president. And further, he says, if there are protests that challenge my decision, I'm prepared to call in the military to quell any protests, to use force and violence in violation of the constitution to put down protests. Our view is that this is a major threat to even the restricted democracy in quotes that is allowed for in the capitalist system. And as they allow people once every four years to, do, to vote for which representative of the ruling class will exploit them the least. That's no choice in our opinion. And now you have a openly racist, warmongering, homophobic bigot announcing that he has no intention of accepting the vote of the American people, however restricted it has been, however much blacks are excluded, however much uh, poor people, uh, felons who have served their time are excluded and all others. Our view is that the only answer to that is the answer that we have posed with regard to every social question. The people must speak. And I fully expect that if Trump tries to steal this election, which I think he has an intention to do, the only solution is the unprecedented massive mobilization of the American people in numbers even that put to that that put to the that that are far greater than the 15 to 26 million people that mobilized to defend, uh, to oppose systemic racism in the United States, which is now accepted by virtually everybody. A CNN poll showed that 84% of the American people supported those mass mobilizations. In my opinion, should Trump declare himself president, and ignore the laws of the land and the vote and call in the military, we will have a crisis in the United States in the next month or a few days that pales before anything we've seen before. We want to be part of those mobilizations. We want them to be independent, united front mass actions of the American people. We want the trade unions to be in the forefront of them. The oppressed black and Latino communities be the central leadership of them. And we want them to stay in the streets until this reactionary would-be dictator backs off. That's not to say in any way that we support Biden. We support the right of the American people to choose. We are not for the abolition of capitalist elections at this point. And finally, on the Supreme Court, you asked a very important question. The sheer idea that nine people determine the fundamental laws of the United States is absurd. The abolition of the Supreme Court is our view. 
We don't think nine people who all represent and are appointed by the richest people on earth should decide anything. In fact, the history of the Supreme Court is to preside over every reactionary policy of virtually every government there is. It was the Supreme Court that codified separate but equal. It was the Supreme Court that justified segregated education. It was the Supreme Court that codified corporate wealth, that, re that whittled away piece by piece at the Roe v. Wade. Today, Roe v. Wade is hanging by a thread. The Hyde Amendment restricts any federal funding for women for abortion. And virtually a majority of the states, correct me if I'm wrong, have le legislation that in one form or another restricts the right of women to control their own bodies. Not to mention the fact that in virtually every state, a majority, if not more states, there is perhaps one abortion providing facility in the entire state. And it's illegal for women to go to another state to get an abortion. And this has been the bipartisan policy of Democrats and Republicans. And in fact, if you looked at the Democratic Party convention, they featured politicians like the ex-governor from whatever it was, Kasich, who was an open opponent of abortion rights, who put in an ad in the New York Times of hundreds of elected Democrats who oppose or want to restrict abortion rights. This was the spectacle of the Democratic Party. They wanted to show that racist bigots, segregationists, abortion opponents, and warmongers are welcome to the Democratic Party, giving us the proposition that we have to stop Trump, that Trump is a fascist. That's what they told me as a youngster. We had to support LBJ, Lyndon Bage Johnson, a Texas segregationist, because he was better than the fascist Barry Goldwater. We had to support this candidate to keep the fascist Richard Nixon uh, witch hunter out of office. In fact, I haven't seen a single election where the Democrats and their unfortunate supporters on the left haven't made the argument that the Republican is always a fascist let's vote for the lesser evil. The lesser evil is capitalism. The greater evil is capitalism, both wings of that party. That's why I'm running for president. That's why I ask you to join us, contact us, contact us by emailing socialistaction at lmi.net, lmi.net, or our website, socialistaction.org. You wanna change the world, we have to win the hearts and minds of the American people, not elect yet another evil. And in this case, there's barely a difference between which one is lesser. Very well spoken, Jeff. And I agree that definitely if Trump attempts to um, <coughs> kill the election results, it will be essentially a coup. And I think we're gonna see millions of people pouring into the street um, we've already seen the potential of the, the anger and the frustration that people are feeling right now in the midst of the worst pandemic and racial violence and killings. Um, so I see, I see a big potential in that. And I think we have to become involved in those movements, like you said, to support um, the, Democrat, the democratic right of people to choose. Um, I'm going to go briefly, Jeff, to a question from someone in our audience. Um, and I would encourage people, um, if you have questions, to please post them in the comments and we'll try to get to some of those questions if we can. Um, and the question is, uh, what is Socialist Action stance on Puerto Rico? And also, what about Indigenous nations? for the independence of Puerto Rico. We've always been that way. We've supported that within the framework of Puerto Rico and the United States. Puerto Rico amounts to a US colony. And this was exposed in bold relief when the terrible effects of global warming hit the island of Puerto Rico and destroyed much of its infrastructure. 
to this day, that infrastructure remains in catastrophic conditions because it's not profitable to take our US colony out of the cars of basically a neo-colonial status. So in the United States, we're advocates of freedom for the Puerto Rican people, just in the same manner as we are for the right of self-determination of all conquered and oppressed people everywhere in the world. The United States maintains 1,100 military bases across the world to defend the interests of the capitalist few to exploit the many. So we are for the withdrawal of all US troops from every nation on earth. We're against colonialism in its modern form. We're for abolishing the military budget, not cutting it 50% or 10% or increasing it like the Democrats upped Trump's request of $750 billion another $50 billion, you'd count the money that they spend on secret wars in the CIA, we spend a trillion dollars on war. So we are for the right of self-determination of all oppressed people. We are for the total recognition of indigenous rights and treaties. These treaties, as poor as they are, were won by struggling Native American people who were annihilated by the original occupiers in numbers in the millions and today are reduced to among the poorest people on earth. We're for the right of the indigenous to control their own communities, where uh, we are for the ending of all laws that abrogate treaty rights. We're for affirmative action to make, to make up for the horrors perpetrated on oppressed people, blacks, Latinx, all oppressed people, and indigenous people for sure. We stand in solidarity with their struggle to keep the pipelines off their land. Our comrades were in the forefront of the mass protests against the pipelines in Minnesota and across the country. So um, we stand with the rights of all the oppressed, with the rights of all working people against the capitalist class in every one of the forms of discrimination that this racist, imperialist, sexist, homophobic system imposes on people. Neither Trump nor Biden comes close to any one of those conditions. Joe Biden is basically not even able to look to the limited Green New Deal. And this was a pathetic attempt, which didn't include nationalizing the main energy companies Country, companies in the world. He had no solution to climate change other than to say that slowly but surely he wants to reach uh, zero, uh, net zero emissions by in 15 years from now. Greta Thornburg said, we have seven years to totally not net but eliminate fossil fuel produced energy, otherwise, the state of the planet Earth and its people is up for grabs as never before. Climate catastrophe, which has been moved into second or third place because of the economic crisis and because of the COVID crisis and because of the depression is a fundamental issue in world politics. And the Obama administration and Trump, excuse me, Biden, no matter what they say, under Obama, the United States became the number one fossil fuel producing company in the world, the number one fracker in the world, and indeed conducted, uh, supported a fascist led coup in the Ukraine, which was because US energy corporations wanted to frack the Eastern Ukraine in order to cut off the Russians from selling their fossil fuels to Germany. That is, it was an oil war. And the United States has troops in Africa because they want the oil of those countries, whether it be Sudan or Algeria or, um, uh, or Nigeria and all the other countries. We have troops in a majority of the African countries because we want their resources. We want their oil. We are in the Congo because it is the richest uh, mineral producing country in the world. So we support 
revolutions, or I should say counter-revolutions to remove governments and impose those that would defend our interests. The Republicans and Democrats are co-equal parties of war, racism, and poverty, and environmental catastrophe. Joe Biden learned to say that he is uh, for an improvement on this question in 15 years or 20 years or 30 years when it's too late. In truth, it, in truth is unless we build a mass independent movement that challenges the right of oil companies to pollute, we are lost. Joe, uh, Donald Trump appointed as his secretary of state, what was his name? The head of Exxon Mobil, um, uh, Rex Tillerson as his secretary of state in order to preside over US oil interests in the Middle East, to continue to exploit Iraq's oil, to try to exploit Iran's oil, to steal Syria's oil, all of which countries were, uh, uh, were set upon by US imperialists to control the oil wealth of those countries. But Trump fired his ExxonMobil chief, Rex Tillerson. Why? Because in a private Security Council, National Security Council meeting, where Tillerson as Secretary of State was present, President Trump proposed to increase 100 fold the number of nuclear weapons in the United States arsenal, tactical nuclear weapons. He left the room and Tillerson said, the guy is a effing moron, which is true. Just as his Space Force program to militarize outer space, to set missiles and institutions in outer space to fire down on enemies or perceived enemies of the United States, um, uh, is the uh, bipartisan policies. The Democrats voted for the Space Force. They voted for the military budget. Uh, budget. They supported the US-backed fascist coup in the Ukraine that was led by openly fascist parties in the United States. And they still do today. They support the imperialist intervention in the Middle East to control the oil and wealth of those countries and subject those poor and oppressed nations, regardless of whether they're led by uh, capitalist leaders or dictators, we support the demand to bring the troops home now and self-determination of oppressed people. We have no confidence that US imperialism is gonna solve the problems of the oppressed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. Jeff, let's move. Um, maybe we can take a few minutes to answer another question from the audience um, that's related to the discussion on climate change. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the different candidates and what they said about climate change and what their actions have been on that subject. Um, what the question is getting to the point of um, what would indigenous people do about climate change? What would SA do about climate change? What is our proposal for this momentous question crisis that we're faced with right now, which is, which right now is, um, you know, really being um, um, shown to everyone through the fires that are just raging uh, in California. Well, the indigenous people in the Midwest and the Northwest set the example for the people of the United States by going into streets and in massive protests to prevent the United States government to set up pipelines from Canada to the United States to transport more deadly fossil fuels. The result was they awakened the consciousness of the American people and they forced the government to back off on most of the pipelines mostly because the United States already had a crisis of overproduction of fossil fuels, but they set the example. And that example is mass action. Every single progressive victory of the American working class 
has come from the actions of the people defying the policies of their capitalist governments. The right to organize a union was not gifted to anyone by the administration. It was won in the streets. It was won by closing down the factories of this country. It was won by organizing a broad labor movement that was open to everyone, that excluded the prejudice of the AFL against accepting blacks inside the unions. Our middle name is the United Front, and that is the unity of the oppressed in massive democratic organizations that seek to organize the power of the American people to fundamentally change. We had a demonstration of 400,000 people in New York several years ago on the question of climate change initiated by 350. It was a successful demonstration. We organized 10,000 at the same time in the Bay Area on the question of climate change. But the tragedy was that the leadership of this massive mobilization was the Democratic Party. All of the speakers on the, pre the demonstration on the prelude to uh, the Paris uh, meeting, the COP24 uh, uh, agreements, all of it was predicated on the idea, idea that if you elect the Democrats, you solve the problem. But we elected the Democrats and they began to extend fracking rights, offshore drilling rights, Arctic drilling rights to the same corporations that are responsible. And that is, it's a political question. The future of the planet is in the hands of the people and to the very extent that we cede that responsibility to the capitalist party who profit by fossil fuel, by war, by uh, imperialist intervention, we have lost the battle. I noticed that President Trump is big on forest management as the West burns. In fact, the comrade who is engineering this uh, webinar with Lisa and I had to, be, had to move from his house in Santa Rosa because the flames of destruction were so close. For Californians, it's a daily uh, uh, experience. I live in Oakland, California. We couldn't go outside. We couldn't open the windows of our house because the air we breathed was noxious, caused us to choke by taking a deep breath in the outdoors. These fires are not accidents. They are direct product of the fact that climate crisis has increased the temperature of the planet Earth, have dried out the, the, uh, the forests, have created the very conditions, not only for forest fires, but for destructive hurricanes like the one that destroyed Puerto Rico, the one that causes, the ones that cause major flooding, the ones that threaten tens of millions of people in coastal cities across the world, the ones that have produced unlivable temperatures of 140 degrees. We had temperatures of 100 and 100 degrees in Northern California. It's 100 degrees yesterday in uh, Santa Rosa, California. It was 97, unprecedented in Oakland. And those temperatures threatened to go up and up and up taking the lives of people and destroying vast portions. The last I heard, three and a half million acres of California land was destroyed. Yes, we need better forest management, but primarily we need to end the reliance of this system on fossil fuels. We need to abolish them. They're deadly. They threaten the security and life of the mass of people on the planet Earth, but we can't do it with a system that is dependent on fossil fuels. We have the crazy situation today, for example, when there is an excess of fossil fuel production to the point where the per barrel price of selling fossil fuels is zero, and in fact, less than zero. The people that extract and sell fossil fuels have to pay money to have people store it and they can't make a nickel. But because they are highly monopolized, they still charge 250, 350, 
of $4 a gallon for this deadly poison because they control it. They control the, uh, the plants, they control the distribution lines, they control the pipelines, they control the storage facilities, and they operate as a monopoly to dominate prices to extract more wealth from the American people at the extent uh, at the expense of life on earth itself. Great, yeah, and I totally agree with you, Jeff. Um, I We're almost out of time here, so I, I wanna wrap up just a few minutes with one final question. Um, and you already alluded to this when you were talking about our orientation towards max action, getting out in the streets and building united fronts with other um, organizations and people who are like-minded. Uh, my question to you is, so we've seen, you know, massive protests this year um, against police brutality, people out in the streets, and now all the energy is turning towards the elections. Um, and we see a lot of this. Um, people are so focused on getting Trump out of office um, that they're really pushing towards getting out the vote, um, you know, voting for Biden as a lesser evil, um, and really just focusing all this energy, this massive energy that we've seen from the working class into the election and getting Biden elected um, as a solution. Um, so as a socialist, Jeff, you're also running for president. Um, is voting in the election the way to get to social change? How do we get to the society that we wanna see all these things that we've talked about today? Society free of racism, um, a safe planet <clears throat> with clean air to breathe for everybody um, and free from oppression. How do we get there? Thank you for that critical question. <clears throat> Let me say this and explain in a bit of detail. I propose United Front Mass Action. It's not just a slogan. It's not like just get people into the streets in large numbers and things will change. We are advocates of mass action for a very specific reason. Every day of our lives, we're told that those two fools we see on television are our representatives, that they speak for us, that we have to elect them to change the world. Every day of the, our lives, we're told that we can't change the world ourselves, that we are basically hapless individuals that have no power. Mass action is a principle, principle, tactic of the revolutionary movement to bring millions into the street to break down this contradiction in people feeling that they are powerless. When people went into the streets to defend Black Lives Matter after George, George Floyd's brutal murder, it involved the largest demonstrations in the history of the world. 15 to 26 million people went into the streets and they lent the lie to the idea that they are an isolated minority with a bunch of crazy ideas. They change the consciousness of millions. They increase the confidence. And they brought about an understanding that I'd never seen in my entire life, that the United States is a society of systemic racism. 84% agreed with that, that racism is inherent in the system. It posed the question of legitimacy of the system. So much so that in a matter of days, Things happen that happened that had not happened in hundreds of years. In a matter of days, not only governments, but masses of people tore down the racist civil, right, civil uh, war era statues of the racist leaders of the country. The House of Representatives voted to take down the photos of these open racist segregationist slave owning bigots from the House of Representatives and tear down their statues. Everybody had a promise that they were gonna do some kind of police reform, that the police do on a daily basis what people think 
or thought was an exception with George Floyd. It was not only the daily murders, one on average, but it was the multiple murders that weren't, respond, weren't responded to. It was the systemic racism that dominates jobs that affects doubly and triply women and black women in particular, that affects the educational system and housing system and the communities and access to healthcare. Mass action convinced people that they were right, that they had the power, that they could change the world. That broke down a giant contradiction between what we had known for decades was a deepening anger of working people at the conditions of their life under capitalism and their inability to act collectively to challenge it. So they came into the streets in these tens of millions. We projected sadly that unless this movement was crystallized in new organizations that were not only against systemic racism, but against the source of the system, the twin parties of capitalism, that movement could only, as you say, Lisa, sadly, go into the Democratic Party. And hence the choice that we were given tonight, tonight between two races, one overt and the other covert, between two warmongers, both overt, but the Democrats even more so, between two advocates of continuation of fossil fuel production, one with a, uh, with, with a few sides, uh, a few words uh, cast asunder that maybe they were interested in doing something in 15 or 20 years. So mass action has the effect of changing consciousness. It affects our party in a big way. It allows us to grow from a relatively small party to a mass party of working people with a program that is based on the simple proposition that the working class should rule in their own name, that the majority should rule with their own institutions, that workers need their own party, a mass working class party, a labor party, a fighting labor party that welcomes and champions the positions, the fights, the struggles of the oppressed of women of LGBT people. So in other words, I'm running this election campaign to build our party, and at the same time to simultaneously build every social movement. Let me say unequivocally that there is no party in the United States that beats our record. We are central leaders of the US movement against the wars everywhere. We are founders and leaders of the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNEC, which is a United Front Mass Action Coalition that has mobilized hundreds of thousands and that has thousands of endorsers. We initiated the Northern California climate mobilization with activists in 350 and every conceivable environmental, social justice and anti-war organization. United Front is our middle name. We can't do it with a small group of revolutionaries, but with millions in the street, we can move towards changing the consciousness of the entire population. That means building our revolutionary party to a mass party of the working class, a party with our comrades deeply embedded and helping to lead side by side with every social justice fighter, every struggle that challenges capitalist prerogatives. We are for the abolition of the capitalist system of minority rule. We are for the establishment of a working class government with a program of socialism. And that socialism simply means that the majority, for the first time in the modern era, not the capitalist billionaires, should rule in the interests of humanity. There is no need for humanity to have wars that kill millions of people. The United States murdered four million in Vietnam, a million and a half with the, uh, with the Iraq wars, hundreds of thousands in its support for the dictatorship of Batista in Cuba, 400,000 for US support to the Guatemalan dictatorship, all at the hands of US imperialism and its compliant dictators. We would spend the trillions on war, on unnecessary advertising, on fossil fuel production to improve immediately the conditions of the entire working class. We could provide free healthcare 
for everyone at no cost, free dental care, child care. We could liberate women to allow them the full power of their abilities to contribute productively. We could qualitatively reduce the work day. Under capitalism, technological change means you lose a job. You put in a modern, safe, environmentally precious uh, system of production and it means layoffs. Under socialism, technology, clean, sustainable technology would mean less work. We would have more time to develop our culture, our history, our personalities. We'd have more scientists, doctors, nurses, artists, ballet dancers, and everything else that human beings can advance at, but are forced to chain themselves to capitalist profit system. A perfect example is that both Democrats and Republicans, governors of both states want to send workers back to work in order to increase the profits of the capitalists, regardless of whether or not that is safe or not. We said no, full pay when people are laid off because of the horrors of the capitalist system. Climate, uh, the coronavirus itself is a product of the confluence of the destruction of wildlife, of forests, and the increasing proximity of human being to animals who, are, uh, who have these diseases. That is, it's not an accident. This pandemic has a scientific reason that is directly associated with the destruction of our environment, with the destruction of our forests. We could build a utopian community where war is unknown, where racism is absolutely abolished. There's no need to counterpose black and white. We're the same human beings of different skin color. We both have the same capacity to do wonders to make this world better. The same thing with Latinx and LGBT people. We are a thousand percent against all discrimination in every form against LGBTQI people, a transgender people, and every other sexual preference. It's the right of people to decide their own sexual preference rather than to beg for legislation to be treated as equal human beings. The same thing with the Black and Latinx community, with immigrants and everyone else. So we want to abolish capitalism, but it cannot be done by a tiny minority. It cannot be done by small scale individual acts of civil disobedience or direct action. We need to win over the hearts and minds of millions. That's what Black Lives Matter taught us. That's what's going to happen if these bastards try to steal the election and impose Trump as a dictator. Join us, join our party. We're an honest, open, democratic, inclusive, revolutionary party that sets ourselves the objective of abolishing this rotten capitalist system. You can join, call us up at socialistaction.org. Uh, Email us, socialistaction at lmi.net. Our phone numbers are on our website. Check us out, read our webinars, come to our meetings, join us. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that inspiring close to our evening. Um, and yes, I just want to uh, thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, please stay tuned to our, uh, our website. And uh, if you're not on our email list yet, please join it because we're going to be having more of these webinars. We're going to be having more analysis of what's going on with the election. Um, and we want to share that with you. We want to hear what you think and we want to talk to you so vote socialist this November. Don't give your vote to the capitalists, the two ruling class capitalist parties. We hope to talk to you all soon and check out our great newspaper, um, which is also available on our website in PDF form, or you can su subscribe to it as well and get it in the mail. Socialist Action newspaper comes out once a month and we have the best analysis of everything that's going on in the world. Um, from a socialist point of view. So thanks everyone for joining us again. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing uh, with us tonight. And we hope to talk to you all soon. Have a great evening. Thank you, Lisa, very much. And thank you all for tuning in. We had a great audience tonight. Jeff, finish that.